I hope all of you got the emails. We have hashtags we want to share. Uh, post the uh, session. We're going to share all of the links and updates that we have. Um, and so, to give a brief context on who we are and what we are trying to do here, uh, Parana as a group uh, came together uh, post. Uh, the Aga crisis at some levels with uh, a lot of issues around the security, uh, the bunch of people and the technologists who came to look at government technology and they're trying to do that. Uh, we, we have done a similar uh, event in the past on internet shutdowns in Delhi on how to address uh, technological solutions to internet shutdowns, not necessarily legal aspects of it. So in today's sessions, we want to explain some of our analysis from some of the technologists who have actually tried to analyze how the uh, Aragasetu app has been working and also other apps which are similar in nature. Uh, before I let uh, Riddhi uh, talk about her analysis, uh, I'm going to int briefly introduce you in the context of epidemics and epidemiology. Uh, epidemics and epidemic responses that have taken place in the world. Uh, what we have seen in so far in the world or the idea of uh, epidemiology as a science evolved post uh, John Snow's map of plotting cholera instances in Soho, London, where Dr. John Snow, he made a map of all cholera, cholera affected patients and he was able to use data to identify that it was cholera was spreading uh, uh, through water pumps. This is the start of epidemiology and data has always been used, data or statistics has always been used uh, to solve epidemics. Uh, what we are witnessing right now though is, sorry, there is some noise, can someone mute themselves? Huh. So what we are witnessing right now for an epidemic crisis is we are witnessing a lot of technologists who are trying to provide answers. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not being led by healthcare people. Uh, in, in the case of Dr. John Snow and all the plotting of individuals, it was being done by a health practitioner. I think we have lost Shikant. And he, we are trying uh, to understand. Okay, no, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, mine, no, it's mine. Okay, I'm going to. Uh, I think it's better. Uh, so, what we, what we have seen. Delirium cholera outbreak is essentially a doctor trying to use statistics and respond to it. So that's the case we need even now. We need epidemiologists who are trained. We need Center for Disease Controls with doctors and epidemiologists who are trained to look at these issues and IT can be a factor for them. But in India, we are witnessing the reverse. We are seeing the response is being, at some level, is being led by uh, uh, people who are technologists who are saying that we use technology to solve all problems. Uh, well, that's where we are at. And I'll let the take over and let you explain what's happening with the uh, Corona, uh, with the Arabic state app. Thank you, Srinivas. Yes, I do agree with you that technology can help us, but that alone cannot solve all the problem. And I will just present my findings, what I have uh, found from, by looking into the app, uh, let me share the PDF with you. Can you see the document? Hello? Yes, Riddhi. Yes, Riddhi, you can go ahead. Yeah, we yeah. can see it. So, uh, starting uh, on the top, you can see there are some of the endpoints which have been obtained from the app. So, I uh, installed the app and uh, run, uh, used it as a normal user would. I also went into the code and uh, tried to see what uh, is the logic and what it is actually doing. And uh, these are some of the endpoints which were found hard coded. The first one in particularly is looks a little interesting because that is uh, a protected endpoint. You cannot just access it. It requires some kind of authentication and on accessing it gives you missing authentication token error. Others are just uh, normal, uh, I mean, informative apps with mostly static text, uh, which tries to spread awareness about COVID-19. Uh, if you see the next section, hard-coded API, uh, this is an API key which has been found hard-coded in the code. So uh, I'm not exactly sure what it is doing, but uh, 
most probably it is it is related with the first endpoint that you see uh, auth uh, swarak swaraksha dot gov dot in. Then in the uh, it has root detection um, in place and it is following the standard root detection uh, process. If you can see, it is looking for the presence of files and folders uh, which get created when a device is rooted, and uh, 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 it looks like uh, it could be bypassed because it is following a very uh, standard approach. Then uh, there are some good practices also which the app is uh, following. For example, uh, when it comes to cryptography, it is using Google Tink, which is a cross-platform cryptographic library. Uh, it is also uh, using shared preferences, but not the normal one. It's using encrypted shared preferences, wherein your key value pairs, is also, pairs are also being encrypted, so which is uh, even better compared to the standard approach that is followed. When the app is started, there are certain things that happens. Uh, it changes your Bluetooth device name uh, to some uh, value. And then it checks if your Bluetooth is enabled or not. If it is not enabled, it enables it. And once these all things are done, then the app starts and user is asked to select a language. You know, the first thing that you have, a user will have to do is they have to register themselves. How do they register themselves? Uh, your phone number is what is required. So a valid uh, phone number has to be entered. Once you enter that, uh, an OTP will be sent to that number and you have to uh, provide that OTP. And after that, uh, all it does is it presents you a very simple form where, which is optional. You can or you cannot, if you don't want, you might, not, might choose not to enter any of the details, but uh, you can skip that form, but it will always show you uh, one link wherein if you open it, it again asks you to enter those details. Once you enter your personal details, basic details like, uh, uh, your name, uh, age, uh, uh, and such information. Once you save it, that link disappears and you don't know where it went. It saves it in your device most probably. And it asks you permission. One permission it clearly asks you is device location. It asks you to grant permission to access your device location. The second permission, uh, once you grant this, it again, there's a pop-up that shows up and it says allow your phone to be visible to other devices for 120 seconds so people will generally think okay it is just 120 seconds let me allow but i think uh, uh, when you do this there are a lot many other permissions which are being granted uh, because unless and until you give this permission you will not be able to use the app uh, it, there is no back button back doesn't work cancel doesn't work you have to give this permission at this point uh, and after that, oh, your phone number Please is validated. Uh, one question, one request from a participant. Uh, could you zoom into your screen a bit? Because the fonts uh, are a little small. OK. Uh, can we share this document with them? Yeah, we can, I think we can do that. Because uh, if you're presenting from your phone, then I don't think you can zoom in. Yeah, yeah. because uh, Anand, anyways, so just to answer your uh, request, I think we'll just share the document separately. I think that may help. Because I don't think we can do anything else right now. I can, uh, I mean, because anyways, you won't be able to read all the text at this moment, but I'm just sure. showing the sections so that you can refer to them uh, at a later point when sure. the document is shared. Right? So, uh, that's okay, about you can continue, yeah. or if you can, if you make your screen landscape, that may help. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that, so this, this, yeah, this is much better because now you can scroll up and down as you're referring to the section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks, Eddie. Yeah. I'm going on with So that's about the app. Uh, and then you also have a self-assessment feature wherein uh, you can, it will ask you questions about uh, how do you feel, have you visited any places which is infected with COVID and such. And this is like you can re retake this assessment as and when. Now, this is a good feature, but it depends on how people are using it and how much information they are providing. Uh, everything looks very naive, but in the background, it looks like the main purpose of the app is to know exactly the uh, location of the person and who all they are interacting with. That looks like the main purpose of this app. Uh, if you see at the groups that this package is mapped to, uh, you will see there are certain group IDs associated with it. Like on the screen, you can see, uh, 302, 30,003, uh, and 3001. What they mean is this. So basically, uh, 
any device which has this app installed is capable of creating socket connection with other devices with app installed and they can transfer data amongst each other. So your data can be sent to the other device, data from other device can be fetched and put in your device. We will look into what kind of data uh, they are specifically uh, fetching and transferring. These are the permissions that are being taken, um, that are being used. So Bluetooth admin permission, location information, your internet is being controlled and they're also uh, tracking if, uh, so whenever you start the uh, your mobile phone, if you have shut it down and you start your device, on boot itself, the, uh, the background services will start working and uh, uh, contacting all the other devices nearby. There's a job which runs and does all these things. Uh, so these are all technical terms here. If you see, there's an intent of, which is being used uh, to invoke a broadcast receiver. And it's, it's doing the same thing which I just explained, like finding the nearby devices uh, and storing the details. It also advertises your own device to other devices in the vicinity. Now, if we want to see uh, what type of data it, it is working at, what type of data it is looking at. So these are the some of the tables, the names which have been fetched from the code. The database name is Fight COVID DB, and uh, the interesting ones are here. User device input table, so Bluetooth name, phone number, and timestamp. Exact timestamp when in, when you came in contact with uh, someone else who is using the app. So that timestamp is recorded, and the phone numbers and the device name is recorded. There is also nearby devices input table, which stores the MAC address and how far you were from the other person who had this app installed and then what is uh, your battery uh, power level what is your latitude longitude and again timestamp is recorded the user location is basically tracked and whoever you are coming in contact with that is being tracked now these are all just uh, technical uh, details here and i think uh, these are all uh, uh, these all elaborate whatever I just explained, just more of uh, technical uh, code uh, that I have fetched from the code base. That's it. So that's all I have, Srinivas. Uh, if there's any question, I'm open to take it up. Okay. So we'll let uh, Srikant continue with some of his own analysis and then we will take more questions. Sure. Uh, yeah. Sure. yeah. So uh, before going into uh, the uh, apps, uh, I mean, Riddhi gave a nice overview of what the app does and what data it collects and stores. Uh, but I would just like to uh, bring in some of the other points as to how the app was developed and who developed it and so on. So if you see uh, right from the app's namespace, uh, which has a nic.goe.rok2 uh, and it's released via nic's uh, play store account uh, and uh, whereas the certificate uh, of the app is having from niti ayog uh, whereas uh, in in our analysis we found uh, prior versions of the app which was leaked a week ago before the rok2 app was released and that app and this app share the same uh, uh, same source and uh, it turns out that uh, Make My Trip a uh, ticketing company that are actually behind the development of this app. Uh, now, uh, I don't know why uh, this whole massaging of garment branding uh, took place in uh, under what context, uh, but maybe it's probably because you keep the app alive on Google Play Store because there was some report a while back as well saying, Google has started uh, censoring or kind of filtering COVID apps because there are a lot of apps uh, that, that have come up uh, and they want to kind of give it an official uh, color to this app. And uh, why this is problematic is because we had a history of uh, involvement of private sector in the data ecosystem, digital ecosystem, and there have been concerns around data governance, platform governance, uh, and this has been an ongoing issue on the tech uh, tech policy sector, uh, uh, and and this problem exists say, in platforms such as Aadhaar, UPX uh, for a while now. 
and uh, the same will also be at at some level uh, uh, those problems will be inherited into this app and this platform as well and then the other uh, comment is this app is not open source whereas there have been uh, some of the other contact tracing apps that have been open source singapore is open source their app uh, and they do collect far less uh, information uh, while creating the profile i mean they don't even ask your name and whereas here we do a otp authentication and then we ask for name gender age profession travel history smoking preference all these are very uh, i mean sensitive personal data and, and this gets uh, data based uh, and this app which i mean government has it with some private sector involvement so there are there are some issues there uh, and and main thing is we don't know how this data is getting used and we don't even know concretely as to how what data exactly gets transmitted so while we've been able to make some guesses uh, through some kind of analysis but we don't uh, uh, have a complete picture of what uh, is happening behind the scenes and the source code is not available uh, while open sourcing is not a uh, panacea but uh, it's necessary uh, to kind of have uh, these uh, for us to have uh some confidence and not have fears right and uh, in today's live mid column rahul mathan had actually claimed how this is privacy uh, friendly and privacy first and there has also been a uh, uh, messaging around how this app has been privacy first uh, and and in that article uh, rahul mathan mentioned that uh, all the data that is being collected by the app is primarily stored i mean by data I mean, obviously, the profile data does get stored uh, on the cloud, but the contact history data does get stored on the device first. And and he had mentioned that how uh, this contact history data itself is anonymized, and you only share the device IDs and not the uh, any personal information of the users coming close to you. Uh, but this data too will only be uploaded only if the person is found to be infected. uh and uh, so th- this he claimed was how this app was privacy uh, first in in the sense that it gives agency to the user and the data is not uploaded uh, uh but this claim uh, seems to be false and uh, we do have a fair bit of uh, suspicion that this app does keep uploading the contact history data to the cloud along with the gps coordinates and uh, it is uh, also pertinent to note that another news item that came today afternoon which said uh, the government appointed expert panel will uh, to oversee the technology platform running for covid monitoring uh, will also be monitoring the data that is being captured by arogya setu app and would use that in deciding uh, how to ease the lockdown situation and basically uh, government is trying to use this app and its usage data to kind of have some kind of proxy metrics as to how people are moving around and so on so which is uh, which is possible only if the app again shares data back to the cloud uh, which includes uh, geolocation data and contact history data so so this uh, in itself says that uh, there has been there is an urgent need for clarity on what data exactly gets uh, uploaded onto the cloud and is available for the government because while on one hand rahul mathan who claims to be uh, who says that he has helped the uh, privacy uh, framework around this app and he's been involved in the app and, and he says that only if you are infected the data is uploaded whereas we also hear news which says that government is using data from this app to kind of uh, see and decide on the easing the lockdown now the other thing is uh, privacy is not again uh, automatically granted uh, and it's heavily dependent on security uh, so i tried uh, uh, doing a security static code analysis of this app using a tool called mobsf and uh, arogya setu is not, again not the only app that uh, is being uh, put out by the government i mean there are various levels of government cities uh, state governments police departments uh, putting out apps and uh, rohini lakshmi had written a piece in citizen matters analyzing all the privacy policies of these 15 plus apps so i took a list of those apps and uh, i had done a static code analysis of all these apps 
and the results are not really great i mean uh, starting with even say arogya setu which is which has a security score of 10 on 100 for instance uh, so i mean some of these could be like maybe minor bugs or trivial bugs but it still doesn't give the confidence that uh, some of the basic vulnerabilities that have not been addressed or, or probably there is not uh, enough security testing that has happened around this uh, now uh, nextly uh, one needs to ask what data is exactly shared so if i am installing an app from a privacy standpoint what am i actually sharing so apart from the profile data which say even one could argue technically uh, except the travel history part your uh, common profile data is probably public by now uh, but you you are sharing two pieces of data which is uh, very specific to you so one is your bluetooth mac address that specific to your device and that's not going to change until you change the device now uh, aragi setu will have not just aragi setu on any app which uses bluetooth uh, for contact tracing and to upload you use using a bluetooth mac id will have your bluetooth mac id uh, and uh, an app like aragi setu which has let's say 10 lakh installs would actually be a rich source of uh, a bluetooth mac id database and uh, and we don't know it and we still don't have a data protection law at this point and uh, like if, if that data gets leaked which is again another pristine set of data that you've probably not gone uh, outside uh, into any large databases because remember you, you don't actually give bluetooth admin permission to a lot of apps so you use bluetooth uh, with certain music apps or whatever you won't actually give bluetooth admin uh, privileges to all the apps and they they won't probably have uh, the device identifiers uh, as well whereas i against this database will have this bluetooth mac id and uh, so i mean this potentially could again be if and we've seen the government also having some kind of uh, weaker privacy uh, thinking on data itself and we've seen the wahan data being sold off so you never know next budget shortfall or even for the covid relief you, you just sell off bluetooth data to industry who may have it for very different use cases and and they say that we are kind of selling this data as well so that's that's the other thing yeah yeah that's all i had seen was so we're going to open up for questions but what we're trying to uh, essentially arrive at is that there is a lack of trust uh, in whatever the claims that the government's making and we can't verify all of it we can verify some of it by using some analysis and reverse engineering of these ads but end of the day it's a black box because uh, once the data is collected we don't know what the government's going to do Uh, I mean, you can't really expect that the terms and conditions are great while all the government was required to do is bring rules under the Epidemics Act. Probably, uh, technically, it's not even uh, being done using age-old governance practices. They are actually releasing an app and trying to market it like what uh, corporate firms would do. And there is a new term for uh, this uh, when. a surveillance company actually build some of these apps it's it's been called corona washing uh, like open washing and uh, uh, white washing so and we have some of these uh, surveillance companies which have been building them like pixel ai face tiger uh, mygate in itself some, some of these companies who are directly involved in uh, facial recognition surveillance and surveillance capitalism uh, stating that uh, i'll open for questions Uh, we have some of them already. Uh, I think uh, I can ask them for it. Actually, uh, is uh, it's this is from Ganesh Kumble. Is my PI stored remotely? Will an IC be responsible for any data breach? Uh, he says, how to ensure that the heat map generated in the app is not used to, for state surveillance? Maybe you can answer about the PI store. Is the personal information stored remotely? i think the registration data is obviously stored on the cloud so when you sign up uh, your registration data which includes your profile name age gender profession travel history smoking preference and uh, the survey that you take on 
basically like are you feeling feverish and so on and so forth all those are kind of uh, stored on the cloud uh, so so i mean so that's and if you actually strictly see that uh, that's actually health information so we and, and we don't even have say uh, disha in place or uh, anything surrounding health information and privacy uh, around uh, uh, not, not just the generic data protection uh, so so and uh, will nic be responsible for any data breach uh, i mean so we can kind of say this but uh, in, in the practical terms i mean nobody is going to be responsible so that's uh, So the location history is first stored on the SQLite database, uh, which Riddhi shared. So, but uh, this is where we've got like the conflicting uh, version. So while Rahul Matan in his piece says that uh, the location history will be uploaded to the cloud only if you are suspect of uh, having the infection, uh, we are not quite sure on this part uh, because I mean, a the, the app does keep storing the location history on the SQLite like database first but we do uh, suspect that it also uploads to the cloud so uh, and it's also possible because the other side we've heard the other news story which said uh, government is also using this app data and trying to use it as some kind of proxy to assess the lockdown and uh, movement requirements of people Uh, we have one more question. It says, since the app is using raw SQL statements, would it not be vulnerable to SQL injection attacks? Vidhi, you are muted yourself. Can you unmute yourself? Sorry. So it's using the room persistence library. So it's like a, a parameterized SQL queries. Now, SQL injections do happen in these cases also depending on how it has been implemented. But they are using, making use of room persistence library, which reduces the chances of SQL injection happening. But then uh, how much is possible, how, how vulnerable it is, that can be uh, known only when you do an active pen testing of that. More questions? Uh, about apps from private party developers, example, MyKate, what are the data ownership rules and privacy policy around that? And also wanted to extend one more question from Sharon uh, Sarwakya, uh, where were you able to find all the personal data of an individual is shared with other individuals? Well, it was, no, we were not able to install the device on a rooted device. Uh, we can get the uh, date, fetch the data of an individual only when we are able to install it in a rooted device. So root detection is in place. Uh, so for to know how much secure it is, again, an active uh, pen testing would be required, which we have not done. It's like whatever data was easily accessible without actually breaking the app. We have looked into that, and from that, the analysis has been presented. Question to Riddhi from Karan Saini. Uh, were you able to discover any exploitable weaknesses in the app? If not, are you aware of any other discoveries? Same question to Srikant. Uh, Srikant, you want to go first? Yeah, the uh, I mean the code is obfuscated, so it's non-trivial in analyzing the reverse app. So uh, I mean we couldn't find any obvious exploitable weaknesses. Uh, I, I am not aware at this point of time any such discoveries. Is there. Uh, yeah, so uh, regarding exploits, again, uh, I would repeat myself that we have not, uh, we have just looked at the static code and how much it's exploitable that can be known only when we do an active pen testing. However, there is a, a web view which is being used with JavaScript enabled. Whether it's exploitable or not, I'm not sure. Uh, but generally, there are chances if uh, JavaScript are enabled and web views are there. Uh, there might be possibilities, but it's not sure. Uh, there's a question on how was the static code analysis done? Can you answer that? Uh, yeah, so using uh, the standard tools, uh, there's in Jardify, jDigway, and reverse engineering tools. So using your Android Studio, you can just uh, look into the code. And it was not easy. As Shrikant said, it was obfuscated. 
so you uh, had to spend some effort in understanding exactly what it is trying to do yeah and then uh, the standard mob as if tool also is uh, was very useful in understanding some of the logic there's a question by sridhar on uh, how will a potential patient will be marked covid positive like how will the updates that one individual is vulnerable and one needs to probably go quarantine or probably go to a doctor happen that's a very good question <laughs> and everything revolves around it uh, so one thing is wherever uh, users are asked to enter details there is assessment which can be taken periodically repeatedly any number of times one thing is if the user enters the data correctly of course that data is going to the government and that might be helpful in uh, identifying who exactly is affecting but then uh, are we really sure that people will enter correct data uh, and how many people are using the apps uh, how many um, i mean there are a lot of questions around that so what we are sure is the if you if you have the app installed your location details will be shared will be known to the government and whoever you are coming in contact with that will be known but the accuracy of who is affected uh, and that that we are not sure uh, okay i'm going to take a pause for the questions i'll come back to them uh, i'll compile them but i have hari pillai uh, he is been involved with the uh, gautech singapore which was involved in developing singapore's uh, covid app uh, which they intend to open source soon, soon. uh i want uh, harish to uh, share his uh, experiences on developing their application in singapore um all right thank you very much um okay i did not develop a single thing uh, it was all done by gavtech and i've got nothing to do with gavtech other than uh, uh trying to help them out i am uh, just for um full disclaimer here or full disclosure as well i work at red hat in here in singapore and um the uh, gavtech had uh created a they have been working on this for about 2 months and they eventually uh you know nailed the uh, protocol and they are calling it blue trace so if you go to blue trace.io that's where the protocol uh is described much sure over they have updated it um so uh, they launched the uh the the app that runs on uh, android phones and iPhones uh, on the 20th of uh, march and essentially is using bluetooth and uh with the minimum amount of data uh, uh the protocol is all defined within the bluetooth uh, blue trace protocol uh, i can certainly explain the protocol but i think more importantly uh when they launched it there was about 500000 downloads uh uh in singapore itself and um the uh, two days later on the on the monday the minister was in charge of uh, gavtech uh he announced that they're going to open source it so as soon as that was done i i reached out to him and said you know i'm more than happy to help them to do it the right way and uh then he connected me to the gavtech people I, i mean i know the people in gavtech but i wanted him to do the uh loop around so that they are aware that he's involved in the equation as well and so i reached out to them and so essentially what has happened here is that uh, we will uh, it will be launched uh, actually it's going to be launched tomorrow uh 9th of april uh we will be uh, open sourcing the entire client side which is the android and the iphone version uh, uh, of the code plus the server side as well as defining what the uh, blue trace protocol is and um uh, this will be an open source project that is going to be on the gpl version 3 license and uh there are five uh, community members in singapore who will be you know for want of a better phrase uh, steering this project uh, for the future so gavtech is essentially fought what they have created they call it trace together and this uh, uh, open source project that is uh, pushed out will be known as open trace and open trace will be the upstream of uh, trace together trace together is going to be you know we're going to they, they're going to call it uh the uh, reference in, uh function uh, reference implementation that is operational and the open trace will be the reference implementation of a functional code that is already deployed from there uh, anybody and everybody can uh, you know do what you do with an open source project 
uh, fog the code and all that. And we will have a bunch of technical people uh, from GovTech initially, uh, the uh, initial leaders in the various uh, code bases um, uh, to be on the technical uh, team so that they will be the ones who's probably going to uh, gate on the uh, pull requests that will come in uh, potentially. Uh, but at some point we need to transition them off to somebody else because they are more they, they are needed to continue with the work that uh, GovTech is doing with Trace together uh, so that you know otherwise they've got too many things to do and this and what Trace together is doing has uh, uh, take will take a higher priority once this is opened up so that's the you know thing that uh, I think I can share with you right now and uh, like I said, uh, it will be open source tomorrow. It was supposed to be today, but uh, we wanted to uh, do a little bit more work and uh, finished up, I think. I hope it's all, all done uh, and it will be released tomorrow. And happy to take questions if you have any questions. I am more than happy to explain how the protocol works as well. Thank you, Hari. I'll continue with the questions and if there are any questions, I'll direct them to you. Uh, so I have questions primarily on the whole six feet distance and proximity, uh, especially on how does the Bluetooth proximity measurements work? Uh, how is the accuracy of GPS and the range? The multiple questions on it. Uh, uh, Riddhi, can you answer that? But especially on how does uh, how accurate our phones, uh, Bluetooth, uh, and GPS sensors are? Yeah, so uh, latitude and longitude, as I mentioned right earlier, that uh, every individual's latitude and longitude is traced continuously in short interval of time. And from that itself, you, uh, you would know how far you are from the person, the other person. And that's how they know if you have come close enough to the person to uh, contract the disease. Uh, and should you be put under quarantine and to make any such kind of decisions, was there a safe distance maintained or not? It's, it's all uh, calculated possibly from the latitude and longitude information. And if I may just jump in here, uh, there is a, a deliberate uh, decision made uh, from an architecture perspective and as well as privacy perspective that uh, we will, uh, for, for Trace Together or Open Trace for that matter, the upstream project will not have anything to do with GPS, it's purely Bluetooth. Because what you want is very fine gradularity. You just want to know who passed by you, who was next to you within 10 meter radius. And GPS is not going to be helpful at all for something like that because this is not something that is long distance. This is something that is very within your circle. Uh, you know, and since Bluetooth is a 10 meter radius, again, uh, the radius is one part of the story. There's also the element of what is a signal strength because that's the other thing that uh, uh, this will also detect how strong was the signal so that you know how close you are to uh, be between the two people who have uh, uh, trace together or, or open trace running on their phones. Yeah, I think Harish, you are you're right. The, uh, yeah, they are... Just, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I, I'll just add probably, uh, I'm just, just I'm thinking loud as to why they've also kind of insisted on GPS is it's probably because they want to try some kind of containment um, or an extended lockdown for that portion of zones where uh, they know that an infected person has traveled. That's because probably we still don't probably have a, a high testing infrastructure to test uh, whoever the person has come in contact with. So they could probably uh, use this data and then say use this region uh, is, is now in containment, which is be an extended lockdown for that particular region. It could be a, a, a set of localities in the city or so on and so forth. So where this person has traveled. So that's probably the reason or one thinking around uh, also storing GPS data and tracking GPS data beyond the Bluetooth. So what uh, I would say, uh, adding to Harish, uh, what he was saying, I totally agree. So I was not able to relate because I had been looking at it from a technical point of view. So they are tracking the signal strength and uh, the Bluetooth is being used very actively. So when someone comes into proximity, probably from the signal strength, they know how close that person are, right, Harish? Yeah, that is, that's the idea. So the idea here is the RSSI uh, to be captured by the device, both devices, so they know where, how close they are, firstly. Secondly, there is a timeline, there's a timestamp to that. 
so yeah. that you know how 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 long you were close by. If you're just walking past, you know it's 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 not meant to be an issue. But if you're standing around and all that, yeah, and that that's when you want to try and track it. So that's correct. So. Uh, Actually, now the data makes sense. What I had seen in the DB after your explanation, it does make sense. What you're saying? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to explain what's happening, but uh, the blue trace protocol will be published tomorrow as well. So uh, you are welcome to read it and do whatever you want. But I'm happy to talk about it. But I don't want to, you know, dominate that for this conversation. There, there are a lot of questions actually. Can this app, app efficiently do contact tracing? Uh, uh, Hari and Srikant, both of you can probably answer this. Uh, can this actually work both Indian experiences and uh, what's happening in Singapore? And there are also questions for Trace Together. Uh, is any government authority outside the Ministry of Health in Singapore allowed to access any data like phone number, permanent, and anonymized user ID which is stored in central servers? Can this information be used for anything outside epidemiological purposes? Safer law enforcement. Okay, uh, shall I answer that? Okay, I'll answer that part first. No, this one is purely and only for uh, Ministry of Health, the Singapore Ministry of Health, and only they have the key for that. And this is purely for uh, for the purposes that we have just discussed. The data that is being uh, that you will be in the phone as it gathers as you as you walk around and come uh, come into uh, range with other devices is only valid for 21 days. So. There's a 21 day uh, delete that happens on the phone. So after 21 days, it's, it's irrelevant. The data, uh, because I think it's useful to understand as well, what is the data that is being captured? There is an ID when you first register with Trace Together. Uh, and I quickly walk through you through that because I think it's useful to understand what is actually being captured. Uh, when you uh, load up the app, um, you would be asked, to put, uh, you know, there'll be a bunch of questions that, you know, to ask you whether you're, you're okay with uh, doing this. And uh, then you'll be asked for a phone number to send an SMS to. So you punch in the phone number, you'll receive an OTP, and you enter the OTP. And that's when a unique ID is created between that particular instance of the phone number and the Ministry of Health. And that information is encrypted. And there is another, uh, what is called a, a kind of like a 15 minute temporary ID that is also attached to it, encrypted, and that is sent back to the phone. And that is the your ID from that for that purposes. It's, that's, uh, but the thing is, it's an encrypted one with the public and private key infrastructure. The private key is at MOH and, uh, and uh, you, you only have the public key. Um, so that is the only thing that is stored. And so when I come across another person, that string of who I am, uh, who this particular device is, is the only thing that's exchanged between the two phones. And so over a period of time, you accumulate in your a lot uh, a, a sequence of uh, contacts that you have made. Now, should one of the persons uh, get uh, into a COVID-19 situation, they, they will, when you go to the hospital or something, uh, they will have to authorize the unlocking of the phone as an individual. I will have to un uh, unlock my phone. And then a, a health, a health an authorized person from the Ministry of Health will be there and they will provide me with a number and I would have a number on my phone. I have to, those things have to match. It's like a, you know, a kind of an unlocking mechanism. If not, that information is not available. I'll un unlock and then that information that is in my phone, the logs are then sent over to the Ministry of Health. And at that point in time, all they have is a string of uh, encrypted uh, information they will have to decrypt it because they have the private key. And only after decryption will they know what phone numbers they are associated with. So the phone number is not within the information that is actually uh, stored in individual or provided to every individual phone, which is also after all encrypted. And then they will determine uh, at which point it becomes a very manual process. They will do the necessary uh, trying to figure out uh, where are we, where was, when was this particular contact? Was two weeks ago, maybe no big deal. Or it was one day ago, Okay, maybe that I need to contact this person. And how close was this person because of the RSSI, looking at the signal strength and, and so on and so forth. So they will be able to do that kind of uh, next level. That's what it's a human in the loop system to figure out. Then they do the call, calling up and, and making a decision from there. Any of that, any and all of that data is purely only for this purpose. And at any time on the phone, I can just go ahead and delete it. And when I delete it, it's also deleted on the server side and that's it. Uh, it's all gone. All the trace data is all gone.
So you're actually letting an individual delete all of his data. Yes, that's correct. I mean, as a, yeah, if I have access to my phone, I can delete it on my phone. Uh, how can that will that be verified? I know that it's the idea that when you press the delete button, it will be deleted. But is there a mechanism this can be verified? Well, the source will be tomorrow. You can have a look at it and have a look. Thank you. And there is one more question. Would you know how reliable the Bluetooth proximity is there when there are obstructions, uh, apartments, for example? Say uh, you are in your apartment and your neighbor is in his apartment, yet your Bluetooth are uh, connected, but you haven't passed across with them. Uh, then this, this could mean that it's a false positive. Are there scenarios like false positives and false negatives? Uh, I think this is definitely a, a possibility. That's why the, the need for human in the loop kind of a scenario has to come in. So all I'm going to have, I have no idea who's around me. I have no idea. And all I know is my phone picked up a bunch of random IDs. And only when there's a situation that gets, and, and, I'm, and I'm not the one who's going to be looking at it. It is going to be the uh, health authorities that is looking at it. So once they look at it, they decrypt it, they figure out, they call, they call my neighbor, okay. So my neighbor is you know, aware of it, but because you know, it could be because the walls are thin enough that the signal goes through, but chances are uh, that's not going to be an issue because uh, we may have been completely separate anyway. So I think those are the things that they have to do when they get into that scenario where they're actually doing the calling up and uh, figuring out whether there is any potential for exposure. We have one more question related to the Indian app, part of this issue, is what are Indian government's policies on data retention. How long is this data retained? Uh, in fact, uh, if, you can, if you can answer this, can we actually demand the government to delete our data after all of this? Okay, it's over. Or say, I get tested positive, then I'm cured. Uh, can I ask them to delete it? So I think they said that the uh, data will be residing for 30 days and, and probably rolling over 30 days. Uh, so, uh, but we uh, on deletion of data, I mean, we really can't say now uh, because they have included a clause which says uh, as deemed necessary or something like that in the uh, privacy policy. So they can always say that we would want to use this for analysis or some kind of research or whatever. and then, uh, keep the data as I mean, and they they could still then say that this is anyway anonymized data, so uh, and there's no personal personally identifiable data that we keep. Uh, so so that's on the deletion of data and uh, demanding for deletion of data. Okay, uh, there's one more question to Hari. Uh, it's are the IDs refreshed frequently, or are the IDs bound to the phone number? Say, if I change my phone, do I get a new ID? Yeah, yeah, you should be getting a new ID. But uh, on the other hand, uh, yeah, when you, when you, when you uh, flush the stuff from your phone, yes, it's get, you get a new ID. But the important thing to remember is that the ID that you get is not tied to the phone or whoever receives it. Is, it there's only one place where it, it is kept. Uh, the mapping is only in the Ministry of Health Systems. Uh, and only they have access to that bit. And that's the only individually identifiable information that there is. Not even, uh, you know, there's nothing else. There's no geolocation, no nothing else. We have one question by Malavika, Malavika Rajman. What is the thinking on the most relevant data points for the objective here? That is, I understand is for identifying and for contact tracing a COVID positive person. Uh, and therefore your risk of contact tracing. Like what is the minimalistic amount of data would one require? Uh, like what all data can, how much minimi minimal can the data uh, tracking be done? And how much is actually Indian app store? Harish, can you actually talk about how minimal can we go? And maybe Srikanth or Riti can talk about the current app. Um, could you repeat the question? I mean, how, what is the minimum? What, what, what was it again, minimum? What are the minimum number of data points that you require, say, to identify your network 
where if you are if you are uh, positive and you want to identify whom all you have been in touch with, uh, like okay. Indian app is collecting GPS data what the Singapore one doesn't. Yeah. So how how low can we go in terms of uh, data minimization? Uh, what would be they say bare minimum one can ask? So so basically. Uh, so basically, you, when you have when you have a contact uh, that is logged in your phone, what that tells you is that there is a person at a certain distance and at a certain time that was near you. That's it. Uh, then what they could do potentially is when you decrypt when it's decrypted, they figure out okay, there's this particular phone number and this was at this time, and is there anybody else around it? It could be that, you know, that might be a person who has got a relative or somebody who may not have something else, may not have a phone, may not have some, uh, some, some device that is enabled for that. So when they do the call up, when they call up the person whose phone was, uh, uh, you know, close to mine, they can then do the uh, uh, determination. Say, okay, you know, we think that, I mean, what conversation they have, I don't know, but it will be decided based on, Asking them, you know, we noticed that you may have been potentially exposed. Do you think there will be somebody else as well within your circle? That means this is now one level away from me, right? So that is entirely dependent on the human communication because that is a very uh, intensive uh, conversation that needs to happen. And that is done by the contact tracing uh, people who are doing that at the Ministry of Health. Uh, Sikant, can you let us know how much Sikant and Riti can you let us know if we can minimize the amount of data collection that is being done to this app? Uh, do you agree that this is good? Uh, it's actually minimum or is it actually excess? Uh, I think the Bluetooth uh, one is probably the standard uh, things that have carried across uh, different uh, countries. But I think uh, I mean, we need to see the other side as to see why they would probably be also tagging geopods. And that's probably because we also have a low smartphone penetration or, or probably the, the highest smartphone penetration is still about like uh, 400 million. And it might not be the case that uh, not everybody still uses these apps and uh, they would probably want to have some kind of uh, information as to where this person has traveled, at least whoever has smartphone has this app installed and then use that piece of information to do some kind of containment uh, because they, they probably also again even for this app to kind of work and be effective you need to have a minimum uh, volume or threshold to, to get the network effects and then have everybody in uh, so this again this app will again be efficient only if everybody who is going out is also having it so if you just go out in the city and you are the only one having this app, this app is the data that this app is generating is basically useless, right? So I, I think in that context, they probably added the GPS. So we don't know, but GPS also obviously adds into the surveillance pairs uh, where it might be on the other hand seen as excessive data collection. We have one question from Siddharth Dave. Oh, sorry, did he, do you want to add? No, I agree with whatever Harish and Srikanth have said, uh, totally. The other information that is being asked when you are registering or in the assessment, they are all optional, they are not mandatory. But what is mandatory is enabling the Bluetooth and giving all the permissions that they uh, ask for. Uh, so it looks like uh, they are more interested, the government is more interested in knowing if the people are uh, coming close enough and uh, I mean to avoid they are not coming in close contact. That's the main intention. If it's like that's the interesting data that they want to collect. There is a question from Siddharth. Can I just add one one bit here about the GPS portion? Uh, one of the challenges with, with GPS is when you are supposed to be in the house, you're supposed to be at home, you're supposed to be wherever you are supposed to be. You are inside a building, and at the, at which point the GPS uh, granularity becomes useless because there's there's you know you know, 10 meter radius or whatever in a building, everybody's in the same place. So you really cannot discern who is where. That's the, that's, that was the logic behind why uh, the GPS portion makes, makes no sense from, uh, from, from a design perspective of Blue Trace. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, just to add, uh, I think here the GPS perspective comes more from a concept of lockdown and containment zones rather than individual contact tracing. So the GPS is kind of more used as which areas do we use, mark as containment zones and so on, and not say for individual contact tracing. That's more from a policy decision point of view. Okay, so there's one question from Siddharth. Uh, it's more on the what if you are alerted that you were in close con contact with the infected person, uh, then do you have to go report yourself to the Ministry of Health or do they come to your house? How does this work considering they probably don't know where you're actually living? Well, uh, should I? Uh, go ahead. Please. Yeah. So there is something uh, they are also doing and the app also does is uh, send you push notifications. So if uh, government thinks that you are infected or you are vulnerable in any way, or if uh, for whatever reason they want to communicate with you, they can send you push notifications and tell you what you need to do. So there will be instructions from the government and, and if they can't identify, they'll try to trace you. They have capability. If they want to use it, they can use it. I think this is where, just to add on, uh, this is where the, some of the other state and city apps, they also have uh, even far more uh, granular activity controls where you have to send in selfies at periodic specific intervals of time and so on and so forth. So, I mean, those kind of functionalities could also be plugged into this app as well. So, you never know. Uh, there's a question whether there is any instances of of these Bluetooth apps actually being successful. Do they actually help solve the issue at large or are there distractions? Only time will tell. It's, it's an experiment and you just have to wait for the results. Yeah. yeah, that is correct. I think the one of the things that uh, even from a Singapore perspective, uh, we are not even 21 days into the launch since the launch of the app. Uh, and uh, we want to make sure that the data has actually been erased. Uh, to, that is 21 days older, uh, 21 days and older. So we are just, I think, coming up to 21 days by the end of the week. So we'll see what happens. But the code will be something that you can have a look at and, and clear. I guess that's it. We tried to answer most questions. Um, there's one last question, I guess. Uh, who all has access to the data generated by RDK Sable app? And what and at what stops interdepartmental sharing does it happen and what data points are being shared? Is it shared with the police? Because we also see police are going door to door sometimes uh, when individuals are being uh, asked to be quarantined. So if you read the terms and conditions, so it says that the data is being shared with the government, but if need be, if uh, there is certain situation where data is required for legal purposes or any other purposes, then it might be shared on a need basis. So I think terms and conditions could be elaborated. Uh, they're not, to elaborate uh, and they do leave room for confusion and uh, a lot of guesses could be done. Uh, so yeah, I think that's one area where it could definitely improve so that people know exactly how the data is being used, uh, under what conditions, what could go wrong or what could happen. Thanks, Vivi. Uh, so there are a lot of claims that the Indian government is making, uh, but most of them can't be verified. I think I've already mentioned that. Uh, but the main problem is uh, these apps do not work without the human intervention inside of it, and that's something which is already missing in terms of an actual healthcare response because you're seeing a lack of uh, protection equipment for the doctors to actually go to the response. Uh, so will these app help? I think they can be a good addition if they work fine, but uh, at the end we have to accept it. It's, it's an experiment and it could uh, fail. Uh, but the problem with the failure is, does it uh, mean that individuals who have this app uh, 
actually ventured out hoping that if they actually go meet someone uh, who is positive, they will be informed so they can take care of themselves. The issue is actually how this information will be used by the government to essentially let the population move. And I think the Indian government has to answer a lot on that perspective. Uh, in this regard, there are a bunch of concerns that tech communities across the world have, uh, including the uh, Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation in the US, the Chaos Computer Club in Germany, uh, who have been sharing uh, various reports and how to evaluate these apps. Uh, we will be sharing some of the material that was discussed in the call today, post the call. And I guess uh, once we have uh, the open Chaos app source as well, uh, we Try to share that and probably allow you to reach out to Hari and probably get a more detailed explanation of the protocol in itself. Uh, at stating that we're going to end this call, uh, it's, I guess, and the, okay, one last question. There are a bunch of questions uh, uh, which were like, oh, can we use blockchain to solve it? Can we use something else to solve it? I think what must be understood here is uh, it's a healthcare problem and technology can only aid in solving this provided there is a healthcare first response. It can't be a technology first response and I guess that's what most of the technologies around the world are saying. So any new technology except unless it's a vaccine, I don't think it's going to completely help out of the box. <coughs> Uh, anything else that you want to add? Closing comments, each of you. Sure, let me just go ahead. Uh, I, I, thank you for the opportunity to speak, but I think I just wanted to highlight, uh, mention that putting any kind of technology solution is not, as, as you rightly mentioned earlier, it's not the intent here. It is to solve a very, very critical and highly urgent uh, problem. Uh, anything else uh, is uh, it becomes an overkill. And just to speak the specific thing with, with blockchain, the, the the problem even with this Bluetooth, you need to make sure that the power consumption is managed. You need to make sure that's you know the encryption that needs to be done to send the signals. I mean, send the uh, the IDs across. You don't want to suck into the power uh, uh, the budget of the phone. So you need to make sure that you have enough capacity and the phone still works reasonably well. So many, many uh, trade-offs that happen. So you have to minimize what you can do and, and work within the, you know, the, 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 the parameters that we, we have to uh, set ourselves under. And that's about it. Thank you. Uh, Riti and Srikant, do you, want, do you want to add anything and end? I think uh, Delhi government seems to be doing, uh, taking steps which which looks like a sensible thing. So they are not depending totally on the technology, but they are making very clear that what has to be, uh, they're taking steps. And I think that should be expanded to entire country. Uh, that what is the plan? Uh, now that the app is out there, app alone, as you rightly said, technology cannot uh, solve problems on its own. So app is out there. It is there to help all of us. And we are ready to be part of it and to help the government. But then we don't want to be, a victim of uh, doubts and we don't want uh, government to just uh, scare us and uh, try to impose something which we do not understand. They should also tell us that what are they going to do with this and uh, what medical solutions are they going to provide in addition to this. So uh, Delhi is setting a good example in that front. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, I'll add to that and say, like all technology governance uh, issues that we've been facing in India for, for a while now, uh, this too needs uh, some kind of community participation. Uh, I mean, I can understand that this app was probably developed in a very short span of time given the crisis, and and but it, it probably, I mean, we can give, I mean, I will take this opportunity and say the community is ready to work with the government and we can see middle points and we can together solve these challenges. I mean, the app probably will have, uh, I mean, they can open source it and they can have much more contributions to it and so on and so forth. So, I mean, we need to see how we can, uh, for the short term on this app, for the purpose of this app, um, I mean, even if it's a technological solution, I mean, because given that, uh, I mean, software engineers are not going to invent vaccines, 
software engineers can still do things that can help things around on this solution space itself and and government should probably uh, try and engage larger community uh, and and propose solution than do uh, some kind of uh, you know central planning with a close set of doors and limited set of people Can I just add one more thing here? I, thought, I just yeah, remembered. Sure. Uh, one of the uh, design uh, factors behind uh, Open Trace is to be able to help create a federated tracing uh, system between uh, uh, accredited health authorities. So, if somebody is traveling to another country and you are using, you know, your that country's app, I, when they exchange data, they should be able to. Say, send it back to the respective country and say, so this particular person from the other country was here and the data format, you, you decide how the data format, all, all I know in that data format is this one came from a particular country and this is the authority that uh, issued it. And so uh, between the authority to authority, they will do their own authentication and sending the data across so that it goes across the world. It's not just in one country alone. So this could potentially work in parallel if the uh, Indian government chooses to want to also implement something like this. When you make it an international standard, that sounds good. Uh, so there were a bunch of more questions. I'm sorry, I'm not going to answer them, but I leave it as a question itself. Uh, all of this is bringing questions on know, data anonymization, data sharing, data accessibility, uh, a lot of questions on data and a lot of questions in technology and itself, not just healthcare. Uh, we can discuss, we can help you understand more about this. Uh, so we have a Slack channel uh, that a bunch of us hang around with. It's uh, for, it's on the site friends.haskeep.com. Uh, you can just access it and we will just hang around and we can potentially look at more apps over the future days. Uh, well, it's the basic set of analysis that we have right now. We will try to see if we can get more uh, uh, such discussions happen, uh, we will take leave for now. Thank you all for joining.